There was one thing, because I know Rich is raising his hands back there saying, not again, you missed it. Uh, when uh, Richard uh, was unable to do his demo earlier, uh, Rich Green pointed out um, conveniently that within each of your bags there's a USB, and on that USB is demo bench that we talked about. So you should have everything on that USB drive you need, videos, white papers, um, the distribution accorda, and demo bench, which allows you to go run the demos yourself. So, uh, and Rich has kindly offered to do a webcast to let everybody walk everybody through that demo so you can see how to run it. Thanks, Rich. Okay. All right. You hear me? Super duper. So this talk is about uh, privacy techniques. Um, we heard a bit about SGX this morning, so we're only going to touch on that briefly. And we're also going to discuss uh, the competing strategy that some of uh, other platforms in the DLT space use, which is zero knowledge proofs. Now, we haven't really talked much about that up until now, because um, we've been talking about the things we are doing versus the things we are not doing. But of course, it is a reasonable thing to ask what has led to this strategy, what, are the, what was the thinking that went into it, and also, of course, what are these zero-knowledge proof things? My colleague here, Costas, who's one of our three cryptographers, will be assisting with an explanation of how zero-knowledge proofs work and, and the basics of the technology, and then I'll be discussing a bit about the comparisons between SGX and ZKP. So that's what this talk is about. Now, privacy is one of those you know, what we are trying to do with distributed ledgers is a paradox, right? We're trying to share data, but also not share data. And that is not a very easy thing to design. Um, you know, you want to share it because people need to be confident that um, the transactions are valid, that the ledger has integrity. But you also don't want to share it because you don't really want them to learn anything but that, that integrity exists. You don't want them to learn why it exists, just that the ledger is correct. So there are lots of different techniques uh, that can be used to do this. So there's you know, there's the advanced cryptography, there's things like zero-knowledge proofs and ring signatures and homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation. There's also secure enclaves with SGX, which we heard about from Simon this morning. There's also techniques like what Bitcoin pioneered, simple things like key randomization. You just change the identities in transactions to be random and anonymous. And then, you, of course, really you want a way of linking them back to a legal identity. So this is a feature that we call confidential identities. Um, to distinguish it from the Bitcoin thing, which is just randomized keys. Confidential identities automatically anonymizes and de-anonymizes identities at the right time. That will ship in version 1.0. So our privacy story is actually more encompassing than just SGX. We have other things too. For example, our transactions are structured in what's called a Merkle tree. Those of you who have studied Bitcoin or Ethereum will know this data structure. That allows you to reveal bits of a transaction without the rest. And then there's a whole bunch of other things as well that we can add on top. On the other hand, we also have you know, individual features of any given scheme. For example, uh, if an algorithm becomes weak, how quickly and easily can we switch it out for a newer algorithm? This is especially relevant with the impending quantum apocalypse, which Costas will discuss as well a little bit. Uh, you know, how do we deal with random number generation, things like that? Uh, does a PKI fit into this and so on? So there's a ton and ton of different technologies, all of which need to be considered, evaluated, designed, integrated, and possibly deployed. Um, and a big part of the work we do as part of the platform on your behalf as app developers is figure a way through this maze without getting eaten by one of these monsters that's along the way. <laughs> and there are quite a few. All right, so let's do a quick recap. So we, um, you know, we announced we're working with uh, SGX uh, a bit earlier this year. There is, um, uh, you know, all, uh, well, so silicon from Skylake Plus, uh, which uh, uh, Intel Skylake chips started coming out at the end of 2015, have SGX. It has the features which Simon covered this morning, the encrypted memory. You can seal off your software, and then you can prove to other people you've done it. And this is a pretty good fit, turns out, for distributed ledger technology. And many other things, too, not just DLT. It's very flexible technology. So that's the route that we're going. But of course, not everyone is going that route. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there we go. Um, to make this easy for people, uh, you, know, you don't want to write your smart contracts in C because you'll get it wrong. I guarantee you'll get it wrong. Even if you think you know C, you don't. And so you know, we have a JVM that gives you memory management and so on. Um, that runs inside the enclave, and this is being integrated into Corda at the moment. And what this gives us is an encrypted global ledger. So we get to have our cake and eat it. We can share data, yet to not share it, which is what we want. Now, there's an intro level talk. Uh, this morning's talk was very um, in-depth. It was very technical. It was for those of you who really like the meat of, of, on the bones. Um, the, there's a talk available on our Vimeo channel, 
which is designed to be understandable by people in the business, your management chain, and so on. It's a high-level overview of, of what this whole thing is about, what we've done um, in such a way that you can understand it without much technical background. It doesn't discuss page table bits and things like that. Uh, so you can go watch that video. That talk has like cool videos of robots in Intel's factories and things, so it's worth checking out just for that. Uh, but this is not a repeat of that talk, right? So that's um, enough for me on SGX. We, you've heard a bit about it today. You can hear more if you go online. What I want to talk about now is, you know, why we're doing this and not um, doing what, for example, Ethereum is, is chasing, which is a zero-knowledge proof route. Okay, so before we can discuss a comparison, you have to know what we're talking about. So I'm going to hand off to Costas, who Mike. is going to give us a tutorial on zero-knowledge proofs. So everyone would have heard of zero-knowledge proofs these days. Uh, it's one of the most uh, amazing technologies uh, happening. And uh, in fact, it was, the concept was proposed back in 1985. So we, there have been 30 years, almost 30 years, without a solution, a practical solution, actually. And for those that don't understand what's, what's the meaning behind zero-knowledge proof is we have an entity, a prover, that wants to ensure that um, an information uh, that wants to prove to a verifier that the statement is true without revealing anything else. So I will just get to some examples so you can easily understand the concept. It's okay. So uh, imagine that back uh, before even TLS is applied or SSL, we had to send, for example, a password in the server and the server had full knowledge of this password. So the actual concept was to verify our identity, but in practice, what we did is we revealed our secret as well. So there was something required to, to change this process. Eventually, we've used another layer, TLS, that we sent a hashed password, then someone can break the password. Imagine if there was somehow a mechanism, something, a design, that could protect you from the server knowing the private key. And if the server infrastructure is compromised in the future, the secret is still secret. This is very important, and it's one of the concepts of zero knowledge proof. It's that I can prove ownership, that I own a private key or something or a password without revealing this information. Then let's go to something. Um, let, let's go to some games. For example, the treasure hunt game. You want to reveal that you know the information of where something is hidden, without um, without stating or give, give some information, even a, sm a small information of where this location is, is based. And all of, this, all of these examples, for example, Sudoku. Do you know Sudoku? I mean, it's just a simple puzzle game. You can actually, however, prove that you know a solution to this game without proving, without actually giving the solution to the, to the reader. And there are more examples. There are e-voting. There is sealed bid auctions. Imagine that we can now prove who won in an auction without revealing um, all of the bids, or any of the bids. Or the bidder itself can actually prove that, hey, I put my bid. It's already there, but I don't want to reveal uh, my bid to you. Um, so there are so many, so many problems that zero knowledge proof can, can actually solve. I will explain later why it's not always the case or why it's not practical sometimes. But let's go to our uh, to our world, to, to the finance world. Imagine we have to prove you are a part of a group without revealing your, your identity. Imagine, for example, ring signatures, or that we want to prove that in Corda, for example, someone signs a transaction. We don't want to know who is this someone, but we want to know that it's a member of our group, which is very important to, to um, actually find the solution against some denial of service attacks or some other, some other attacks that can happen. And what's more important is we can now prove that we can make a transaction without knowing the actual value we're transacting with. We just know that I just had at least the amount required for this transaction in my account. These are all uh, examples of zero knowledge proof, and there are so many, so many others that um, any other problems that you, we can reduct into an NP problem. Um, the, the issue with zero knowledge proofs is that there are so many definitions. Um, actually, there are sound proofs, or zero knowledge proofs. There is zero knowledge proof of knowledge, that, like the example we said before with the ownership. I can prove that I hold the key, but uh, this is the only thing that I'm proving. There is a witness in distinguishability, which means um, I'm, not, I'm not proving something as a true or false. 
but I'm stating that you don't know which of the keys I use. Let's say I had four keys, and I'm not telling you which, keys, uh, uh, which key was used for this transaction. And there is also the ring signature, as we said before, that we cannot determine which of the group members was actually uh, the signer of a particular message. There is the multi-party computation. Imagine there is a paper now stating that uh, zero knowledge proof can actually be a two-party computation where only one of the parties has an input on it. So again, we compute something secretly, only one member puts uh, some input on this, uh, let's say, proof, then we have a zero knowledge proof again. And let's say homomorphic signature for those who are familiar with crypto stuff. Um, let's say we have two signatures, one signing the amount X, another signing the amount uh, Y. Then we can compute by the homomorphic uh, feature of this signature that um, by combining this signature we can prove, for example, an operation between these two, these two values. Imagine, for example, a donation scheme. Some people are donating money. They don't want to, to, to actually uh, reveal the, the amount they donated, but we can have the full donated amount at the very end, and anyone can prove it. Um, at this stage, I will make an experiment with Mike. This is the first time we try together. We will need some balls. Mike, I need you to the stage. <laughs> okay, it's juggling. Well, no. <laughs> you said we weren't going to be juggling. No. I trusted you. I think some of you are familiar with, um, with the Alibaba cave, where is one of the most famous problems uh, that you can prove how zero knowledge proof works. Now we'll make the shortest ever experiment about zero knowledge proofs. It just requires two balls, and I'll explain why. Um, yes. Orange and oh, red is skewed. Yeah. Let's say I'm blind. Before putting this, I will explain the rules because <laughs> and I can't see how it works. <laughs> Where the concept of this, of this experiment is to prove to you that even though I'm blind, Mike can convince me that these balls have different colors. This is, this is difficult, okay? I mean, I'm blind. How, how can I say that these balls are, are different in color? So I will put this. Okay. I'm, I'm Mike, colorblind. Mike. Does that matter? <laughs> Are you colorblind? We didn't practice didn't this beforehand. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Can you see the difference between these balls? Yes. Okay. Give me the balls. What we're going to do now is that I will... Uh, Mike just told me, hey, hey man, these, these balls are different. I'm touching them, but I'm blind. I can't see if, if they are different. I don't believe you, Mike. So Mike says, okay, let's make a challenge. So what I'm doing now is I will put a ball uh, uh, in front of Mike, and in the next, in the next stage, he, he, I will ask him if I did something, if, if this ball changed. So we start with this. You don't have to say nothing. Okay. And on the next change, I you will just say it changed or it's the same. Okay? okay? It's the same. 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 It's different. It's different. It's the same. It's the same. So if I follow this, I will put this out now. If I will follow this process, for example, 128 times, it's highly unlikely that Mike could, this, could find out that these balls are different if they were not different. But I don't know the color. I don't know which one is, uh, is orange and which one is red. But somehow he convinced me the only statement was these balls are different without revealing which ball is red and which ball is uh, orange. So this is, the, this is how interactive uh, proofs work. And if you understand this concept, then you will get the meaning behind zero knowledge proofs. This is the shortest example ever, and you just need two balls to do it. I can even, I can even do it with more balls. For example, there are some properties in zero knowledge proofs, especially the fast ones, the faster ones, that say that um, while you are making the, the, the problem more complex, then the proof should be bigger or s smaller. Imagine that I had four balls and I had to convince, Mike had to convince me that all of the four balls were different. Either I had to do it one by one, six times, I think the combinations between four balls are six, and, or we can, we can use all the four balls and have a more, let's say, more complex transaction between us, but less iterations. So 
um, this, is, this is one of the best examples of understanding. You can even explain to, to a child now. It's, it's very easy. And I will go to something, OK, to something which is related to the actual practical example of zero knowledge proofs. We can't do this thing by exchanging information in real DLTs and blockchains. It's, it's too difficult and it takes time. However, um, you can easily think of a way how to avoid this interaction with Mike. Is there someone that knows how I could avoid this interaction with Mike and still be convinced? Is there anyone familiar with ZKP? I knew it, nobody. <laughs> okay, so the thing and what's the, uh, the point behind snarks in general and all of these non-interactive proofs is that we can actually have a common reference. Let's say someone, it wasn't me, we agreed with Mike uh, that he will use a random, let's say, string that is found in the internet and we all agree on it to, to simulate these examples I did, then give me all the results back and I can verify without interacting with him. This is the trick behind ZK snarks. They use something that actually simulates this random interaction. And as we said before, the ZK snarks uh, if, you know, if you don't know what it means, is Saxon non-interactive argument of knowledge, which is zero knowledge, what we said before. It's non-interactive. This is very important. Another thing that Mike couldn't do with this experiment is that he couldn't transfer my proof. It's only between us. But in DLTs and blockchains, this can't work. We need transferable signatures. We need transferable proofs. That's why this is practical. The main difference from the previous attempt, it's it enables, it enables signatures to be transferred between members. So if we had the common reference string before, then Mike was, could send his output, his, uh, his choices, um, to someone else. And again, he will get this common reference string and can verify, can simulate again the verification process. Um, also, the, the nice thing is that it's very short. Back in 2007, I, I forgot to remind you that in 1985 that this all zero knowledge proof, uh, let's say, um, uh, industry started to happen and there are algorithms proposed. The first paper were rejected, was rejected a couple of times. Then they won the Godel Prize and now the two of the first authors won the Turing Award. <laughs> so imagine that people don't initially know how this will be applied, but we eventually have some real proofs and some real applications. The, the fact that the signatures are very short is very important. Before 2013, there was not a solution that the proof can be really short so people can actually use it. Now, it's just 280 bytes, whatever the problem you're going to solve. This, this was a major discovery, and this, this changed everything in, uh, in the zero-knowledge proof world. And argument, what's an argument? As I said before, we're just changing uh, balls here, but an argument is everything you can run on your computer and can result on something. You can prove that something is true without revealing all the inputs. Actually, there are zero knowledge proofs that you can't have inputs, you can hide, you cannot use inputs, but practically we use something like a key, like a balance. These are called non-deterministic witnesses or auxiliary values. You will see it in different uh, aspects and different uh, versions in, in the internet. Um, Okay, so what's the complexity behind it? It's really nice, it's, it's amazing that we have this, but it's not so easy to, to come up with a, a proof that everyone accepts. You get a program, whatever the program it is, you transform it in a way that you create actually a circuit of logical gates. Um, the thing is that we need thousands or millions of them sometimes because imagine that even a small, a short program will be eventually a combination of multiple connected gates in order to produce the output. You will need some transformation as well. For example, because let's say we don't support inequality, we have to convert everything to equality. And we have, we have a very simple example here. How can I prove that, for example, someone has AIDS less than two? What we can do to transform this inequality to inequality? One is by subtracting this number, getting uh, the, the first bit which shows if it's positive or negative, and you have an equality. The other thing is you can do 
x, the 8, minus x times x minus 1, x minus 2 equals 0. If x is 0, 1, or 2, then we have an equality and the outcome will be 0. So we converted the inequality to an equality. So there is, there is a need for some people to convert real programs to this uh, logical gate, which is not so easy. So sometimes you need special uh, stuff that can do this conversion. Then you have this, let's say this, this is the most technical part, but it's only this slide. Uh, you have this, this circuit and you have to convert it to something that you can do operations with it. Initially you convert it to a rank one constraint system, as it's called, and imagine it is just uh, three vectors, actually they are sparse vectors, and they satisfy an equation. We're not going into the details of this equation. Then again, you need another algorithm that you create a polyonym uh, from these vectors that actually are dot product operation. And after you go to the arithmetic quadratic product program, you go to the elliptic curve encryption using bilinear pairings, and then you have the ZK snark. This is something just to understand that there is a process of almost five steps, and that's why it's very complex. Um, okay, it works, but what, what are the side effects of it? Um, one of the side effects is it uses special elliptic curves. There are no real standardizations for elliptic curves. Even uh, it, it took years for the actual ECDSA or now EDDSA, which is not still uh, standard. And we need another type of curves now, which are pairing friendly. But there are attacks on, this, um, uh, on these curves. The problem is it's not standardized. We have to use some other curves that are not really tested in the world for a couple of years. Are we sure that it can work in, in a matter of, let's say, three or four years and not another attack will appear? Because every year we have a reduction on the security level they offer. At the moment, for example, there are, uh, there are there is Z-cast, there is zero-cast. They use some, um, some curves that practically they provide less than 100 bits of security. But today, the standard is 128. It's true that we can still break with conventional computers this uh, uh, these bits of security, but we have to go to bigger curves. That's one of the problems that concerns us, and we're still doing research if this can be applied to Corda at the moment. Also, this is the bad thing with the case narcs. We need this trusted setup, the common reference string I made, I, I referred before. Um, this is the toxic waste of the Z case narcs. Even for Zcas and Zerocas, there was a need for a ceremony between people that will exchange some ideas and some information, sorry, and they will come up with a common reference uh, information. Um, this needs to be trusted because they can forge signatures. If, in reality, Zcas and Zerocas didn't follow the process as expected, they can forge signatures. They can spend whatever they like. We don't know if they follow the signature. Th this is what they claim. Uh, I personally believe them, but you don't know. The other thing is that ZK snarks are not post-quantum secure. Quantum computers are coming. We know it, we see the progress already. The last years, it's, it's going faster. And uh, what we can do is just change to another, another snark, not in snark now, it's called ZK Stark protocol, which is not practical. The keys are huge. And the thing is that there is low performance. As you can see on the diagrams on the, on the left, right for you. Um, you will see that to, to create a proof, it takes 10 to, 10 to 40 seconds, initially some, uh, some minutes. Imagine that uh, Eli Ben Sasson, one of the creators of uh, ZK Snark, said that 128 um, uh, SAT 256 functions will take an hour or so, and for one million of gates, programs that are one million of gates will take hours. Now we've managed to go even uh, faster, and eventually, I have heard that there are some attempts that minimize this to one or two seconds. Uh, I'm not aware of any, I, th I haven't seen something running in such uh, a speed, but uh, that's the truth. And although the proof generation is very slow, the verification is very fast. It's just some milliseconds. And as you can see, regarding the key sizes, conventional cryptography like RSA and elliptic curve, elliptic curve crypto, um, the, zero, uh, the proof size for the zero knowledge proof is Okay, acceptable, but you need 
one gigabyte of RAMs, which is too much. Uh, so I just finished with the ZK uh, thing, and let's see why there are some concerns on applying these technologies and why everything can actually break. Um, so there is this algorithm, the, the evil algorithm, the source algorithm that can actually break factorization and delog if quantum computers appear. Uh, you will need a couple of qubits, call them qubits, and um, some quantum gates. But it's true that if we manage to go to this level, then there is an easy algorithm to break all of the existing uh, cryptography. That's one of the problems of public blockchains. Imagine that public blockchains are public. There is history. One can break them because everyone has access to them. That's one of the differences between the private and the public uh, blockchains. The estimated risk is about 15% to, to have an algorithm that will break, let's say, elliptic curve 256 by 200 and uh, 2026 and 50% by 2031. Also, um, I'm going to, to this side of the, of the slide. Symmetric encryption, although it's still safe, as I said, RSA and elliptic curves will break. Uh, symmetric encryption, although it's safe, there is an algorithm also called Grover's algorithm that will um, also need bigger keys so we're safer. Uh, this means that AES 512 or even bigger will be required in the future. And uh, we should, yes, this is the double, the double size. And ZK SNARK, again, it's based on the elliptic curves. We have to go some, to something else. Um, however, there is, there is a paper recently from Daniel Bernstein that says we can still stay with RSA, but we need keys of the level of terabytes. Yes, it's possible, but yes, it's terabytes. <laughs> um, what's the current state on quantum? Oh, well, we need this amount of qubits, more than a thousand and Surprisingly, RSA is more difficult to break on, on the quantum world because the keys are bigger. And it's very interesting that there is this difference. Um, at the moment, we have Google announcing that they will build an annealer, a quantum annealer with 100 qubits by the end of uh, 2017. I don't think they will manage to do it, but probably it's 49 or 50, it's possible. The largest number factor is still very small. It's just 200,000. But there is some companies, for example, D-Wave, that they announced a 2,000 qubits uh, processor. And the, the thing is that they're only focusing on AI problems. It's targeted on machine learning. And it's actually for quantum annealing problems. And as they state, I think they don't have plans to do it for security purposes, to crack algorithms. <sighs> What's... This is 10 times, 10,000 times faster than conventional algorithms. There is still some work to be done on error correction. But what can we do? OK, let's say by 2025 or 2030, we have the quantum computer. What's happening with our current infrastructure and transactions? Uh, well, some of the countermeasures we can get is, we can take is, we use hashed keys. Bitcoin does it already. But what it does is just minimizing the window of attack because eventually you would like to spend the amount. And there is a window that someone that could break faster the, the elliptic curve key can send a transaction as well. And who knows which will be first. There is also the ZK Stark for zero knowledge proofs, as I said before. Not practical yet. We use Sphinx in, in Corda. We have support for Sphinx. In, Corda is already prepared for the quantum apocalypse. Um, we, we support five algorithms. One of them is the Sphinx, which is uh, post-quantum secure. And there is a, a, an algorithm for key exchange, like the Diffie-Hellman we have now. It's called New Hope. Google actually tested New Hope, combined with some elliptic curve encryption uh, recently. And there are some quantum algorithms. There is, there is some work happening on using quantum uh, encryption and quantum signatures, probably, uh, using either optical fibers or satellites. There is some work. Uh, uh, significant work being there, and we're expecting the result because there are still, I still have some concerns for their application, but they're going on the correct path. So um, this, is, this is the current state for, for uh, post-quantum and zero-knowledge proofs. Back to Mike.
Okay, thank you, Kostas. Yeah, that was pretty good. I'm not even sure I did the balls correctly, but you got the idea. All right, so how is this relevant to Corda and DLT? So there's two ways in which uh, things like Corda and its competitors can use zero-knowledge proofs, right? The first is like the automatic, you don't have to think about it, everything becomes hidden automatically, that's the holy grail, right? And that's kind of what we're aiming for with SGX. I said earlier, you won't have to understand, uh, you know, all of the, how the hardware works, you'll just write your core apps and follow the instructions and everything gets encrypted and it goes away. Um, so that would be great if we could do that with ZKPs, but that's really hard, that's a long way off. And then there's a second, slightly more practical in the short run uh, approach, which is these sort of ad hoc tactical integrations by experts, and that's more realistically what can be done today. If you accept the caveats, which, uh, um, you know, Costas has done a good job of describing. So these are cases where we take a really important, widely used application, like maybe cash, and we go in and you know, specialized cryptographers apply a zero knowledge proof to that application, specifically to a small part of that data, and we launch that integration, right? Now, um, you know, it's for this reason that um, if you look at the space of DLT frameworks, um, you know, so it's really, so Ethereum is interested in this, and um, you know, Quorum sort of inherits that interest, I think, and they've, uh, you know, they're partnering with Zero Cash. Um, there is one production system, which is zero cash, which uses this technology, and they, they run a system that works, and it's slow. If you send a zero knowledge protected transaction, you, then you're up to your 40 second time to send money, but it, it seems to work. Um, but there is a huge catch, which people are not discussing, which is that this only works for cryptocurrency assets, right? Because they, they did that approach. They, did, uh, they had specialized cryptographers who took a very specific application, which was cryptocurrency, and they integrated a custom zero knowledge proof just for that app. So you lose smart contracts. And uh, zero cash is in fact a modified Bitcoin, and you have two types of transaction and two types of coin in the system. You have the magically protected kind with zero knowledge proofs, and then you have the ordinary kind, because if you want to do anything fancy, that's the kind you have to use. Right. So, um, and, and our working assumption is that that's not going to fly, right? Uh, you, you can't, um, you know, people come to DLT and they say, we really care about being able to define our own asset types, our own business logic, um, our own smart contracts. You know, we can't have a situation where normal programmers can no longer write apps. That's not acceptable, right? So that, that's what we see in the market and that is a problem. The core issue, which was touched on very briefly by Costas, I don't know if you noticed it, is called arithmetization. To write a zero knowledge proof today, uh, a proof um, demonstrates solutions to systems of algebraic constraints, right? systems of equations. Now equations, I'm willing to bet no one in this room has ever written a program in the form of pure equations. Right? I'm, I'm sure of it. I will bet you guys anything, none of you have ever done that. Because no one does, that's not how we write programs today. Right? And in fact, it's extremely difficult to express even very trivial business logic, like an if statement, uh, with equations. And this is why simple problems balloon up into millions and millions of equations when you do these transforms um, that Costa's mentioned. And that's just the first stage to get to the circuits, and then you have the other five steps, which are all very slow and expensive as well. Now, totally not realistic to expect non-specialists to write rank one constraint systems, because this is what it looks like. This is a part of the zero cash code. So this is a DSL on top of C++. So those of you who know C++ can probably read this. Well, it looks like ordinary code, so you can probably all read it. But, but observe, I want to find my laser pointer, yes. Observe things like uh, this line, witness phi. Well, what does this do? I don't know, does it matter? If you take it out, does things break? Probably, you know. This is, this is code, this is one part, this is, so this is a, a small excerpt of the code which loads values into the proof system for proving. It doesn't even do the proof. Um, and all it does is check that the left-hand side of a transaction adds up to the right-hand side so that you haven't destroyed or lost money. That's all it does, um, and it takes a long time, and good luck writing this code if you are not, you know, even I, though I can understand parts of this code, I wouldn't trust myself to write it, right, because I'd probably make a mistake. So, so zero-knowledge proofs, <laughs> called moon math for a reason. Right? So here's another problem which, we, which Costas did not touch on, but vexes me very much, and I think I may write about this problem soon, because this is a risk for the whole field of cryptography. Um, cryptography is associated in people's minds with unbreakable, right? People hear the word encrypted and they say, cannot be broken by man nor machine, completely solid. And cryptography has this reputation because it is a very conservative field. 
because the systems of cryptography we use today are rooted in research that dates from the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and all crypto today is based on the assumed hardness of mathematical problems. We don't know they're hard. We can't prove they're hard. We just suspect, we think they really must be hard because lots of really clever people have spent a lot of time trying to solve it and God, they got nowhere at all. So it must be hard. Um, unfortunately, you know, these modern branches of cryptography that we're talking about here are not like this, right? Uh, they are based on what's called uh, bilinear pairings, which is a new branch of crypto that started around the early 2000s. And one of the um, problems of this subfield of cryptography is, is the researchers like to invent new mathematical problems and assume they are hard. And are they really hard? Well, there have been some unfortunate events in the past where cryptographers have published papers and they've said, here is a new mathematical problem. It's really hard, and even better, we have proven it is really hard. We have a security proof that this mathematical problem is genuinely unsolvable. And then uh, in one case, a year later, someone published a solution. So it turns out it's not proven after all. Hmm? Uh, and if you look into how that happened, what you see are, unfortunately, um, cryptographers often obfuscating the strength of what they are doing because this allows them to publish papers. These security proofs that they give are based on certain assumptions. The proofs hold if the assumptions hold, and yet these assumptions are getting less and less realistic with time. Ever newer crypto is now being deployed into production without the customary 10 or 20 year wait that has previously uh, preceded deployments of new crypto systems into production. So people are now, because, and the reason this is happening, of course, is, is suddenly zero cash means there is a, um, a path to money from deploying new cryptography. So we're seeing algorithms being in, implemented and deployed to production that are only a year old, that have been proposed in PowerPoint presentations, right? The, the peer review, is it there? Maybe. So these are, these are the risks. And then finally, of course, you've got huge key man risks because this is very, very hard to understand. So if your team gets hit by a bus or, you know, all quits because someone gave them a, a better paycheck or whatever, uh, you can risk ending up with code that no one, no one can understand. And good luck ever hiring anyone who can tell you what it does or how to fix it with the current state of the uh, technology, right? And it's for these reasons that when this technology was first introduced to the Bitcoin community, I was there in the room in 2012 when the very first presentation uh, by ZKP researchers was given to the cryptocurrency community, it was immediately nicknamed Moon Math because it seems like alien technology, right? That's how complicated it is. Now, I, don't, I sound down on this, but I, I'm kind of not, you know, mankind did reach the moon in the end, right? It took a lot of work, but we put a man on the moon. And this is really hard, it is moon math, but right, we will get there in the end. Humanity did that, and we will succeed at this too. The question is, when? And how many people will get blown up along the way? Now, <coughs> things, things we need right, to achieve that holy grail. Right, what we need is a compiler, a special kind of compiler that doesn't compile to machine code, it compiles to equations, uh, algebraic constraints. So you can feed in your existing Java bytecode from your verify functions and your core apps, and which converts them to rank one constraint systems or one of the other uh, systems of equations which these proof systems use. And the goal here is such that we abstract the difficult bits so that ordinary programmers who are experts in interest rates and derivatives trading and all this stuff can, can build these systems without having to study you know, 10 years worth or 20 years worth of academic research. And of course, maintain them. Trustworthy initialization, as Costas mentioned, Zero Cash was initialized by a bunch of people who claim they went through this fascinating ceremony where they bought computers and then smashed them with hammers and things so that the, the private key material won't leak. But did they go through that? I mean, it sounds like a good ceremony, and they probably did, but if they just got together and pretended they did and it was all a bit of theater, we would never know. And yet, it would have allowed them to print as much Zero Cash as they like. Now, you know, if in effect it turns out that it's impossible to design a ceremony which completely removes the, um, the, the, the chance of failure, chance of funny games. So what you need to do is change the algorithm so there's trustworthy uh, initialization. Post-quantum ZKP, Costas has talked about that. We need a way to deploy it into a live network, of course, because by the time this technology becomes usable um, for this holy grail approach, uh, we will already, hopefully, <laughs> unless we fail very badly, we will hopefully have live production networks uh, running with SGX and running with other technologies that we need to deploy into. So we need a way of incrementally deploying this technology. Right? Well, yes, um, it's not normal that I ask for people to innovate less fast. Um, 
usually that's a good thing to, to invent new things, but in this case, of course, the problem is that these algorithms are now changing almost every year, right? Almost every, si every four to six months, a new academic paper comes out with big improvements to this technology, which is awesome, but what does it mean? It means that all the peer review of the previous stuff is somewhat invalidated, right? We go back to square one when it comes to testing a lot of this maths, because it's all changed. And because the peer review of the maths would be so nice, because that is where all of the trust in cryptography comes from, we need at some point for these algorithms to stabilize so we know what is actually being checked and to some extent who has checked it and we can check if there are mistakes in these maths because there have been mistakes in zero knowledge proof algorithms that have been published in court, right? But o only a long time after the papers were published. And um, we assert, well really I suppose, I, I assert that these things are not really quarter specific. These concerns are actually general uh, for all DLT systems. Um, you know, it's, it's, we can't ask you to learn the zero knowledge proof technology in its current state, right? People like myself and Costas, we read these papers so that we know what's happening in this space, but we can't, it's not reasonable to ask people to learn this stuff when it is so hard, right? The apps are hard enough to write already, so until we have a working abstraction that makes it easy, like we are building for SGX, um, it's very difficult to, to ask people to really get a grip on this. Unfortunately, if you look at, for example, what Ethereum is doing and so on, they sort of gloss over this. They say, well, add an instruction to the EVM that checks a zero knowledge proof, but you're on your own if you want to actually make one and use it. Well, it's okay for experimentation, I guess, but that's not going to help us in the, in the short to medium term. Okay, so again, I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna sound too negative on this stuff, right? I really, this is a really, really cool branch of maths, very powerful, very interesting. This stuff will be in our futures, right? Um, and I want to see them succeed. I really do, right? Th this, is, this stuff should succeed because this will make society better when we can eliminate trust from things with maths. Um, and in one day, uh, for some things that we will be using SGX for, this could be used instead or on top of. Not everything, right? Uh, secure hardware is more general than zero knowledge proofs, so you can do some things with it, but not everything. Um, and we, although we haven't gone into them in this talk, we do actually have fairly detailed plans about how to do some of this work, right? We've done some design thinking around it. We don't plan, it's not on our roadmap, right? We don't plan on implementing it because we're, we're still waiting for research to resolve some of these other issues. All that said, what I've been talking about here is the holy grail of all general, you know, automatic uh, privacy of transactions. There may still be, right, ad hoc specific, uh, contract specific cases where the integrations make sense to think about, like a cash specific zero knowledge proof, uh, securities specific zero knowledge proof, or whatever. Okay? So that's our thinking on zero knowledge proofs, and I hope you have a, a better understanding of this technology now, because you'll certainly be reading about it from other, other players in the DLT space. And uh, that's the talk. So, any questions? I think we've got five minutes for questions just because we. Um and the optimistic clock, we got five minutes for run with that. All right. Uh, so we don't hold to be back from drinks. Um, hi. Um, hi. There's been this maybe cryptic and strangely named cryptocurrency proposal slash prototype called Mimble Wimble. I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, if you did, I wonder how, how does it uh, kind of look in this context in terms of uh, security of the crypto and, and its quantum security. Yes, I have. That's the one written by the guy who uses uh, Voldemort's name, isn't yeah. it? Yes. <laughs> I prefer the name Satoshi, to be honest. Um, uh, Mimble Wimble, I, I, I'm aware of it exists. I haven't really looked at it. I, don't, I can't answer the detailed level of questions you're asking about it, I'm afraid. Um, probably isn't post-quantum secure. Like I said, as Costas mentioned, all of the existing um, techniques really today are built on top of elliptic curve cryptography, which is not. Therefore, I'd be very surprised if it is. This is uh, something that people are starting to think about now, but schemes up until really this year probably wouldn't have focused on it much. Yeah. Okay, just uh, quickly, is Monero using zero knowledge proofs in their protocol? Monero uses ring signatures, so that would be a, an example of a sort of non-generic, one of the, what I call, I mean, <laughs> calling them ad hoc integrations makes it sound a bit bad. I, there are techniques, you know, that's a technique that can, is, can be applied very specifically to um, that case where they've, they've integrated it for um, cryptocurrency transactions. Uh, that's the sort of thing where we may well consider in future, but it would not help the vast majority of people building apps on top of the platform, right? It would only be applicable to a single contract, probably cash, 
And probably one more question. All right, excellent. Okay, we're done. Thanks a lot, guys. Great, thank you.